Lucas is 24. That song came out probably 44 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Larry that's said. Why, that's why he just sat there going. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think I'm third wheeling a little bit here. Okay, well, hello and welcome to another episode of Bang for Your Business with me, James Bonet, and Lucas Hamby. Hi, Lucas. Hello. You can subscribe to this. Uh, we're on Spotify, YouTube, and if you find this interesting, please share. Right, I'm really excited this morning. Uh, our host today is none other than Steve Fowler, Editorial Director of Dennis Automotive. Hi, Steve. Hello, James. How's things? Uh, good, slightly weird, sitting here in my front room. Um, I have a, a window behind me and a light in front of me, so it's slightly Robert Peston style. Uh, I have to have the light on and the blind shut, otherwise my neighbours start waving at you. I think you look fantastic, so that's, fan that's great. Thank good you. start. Can we, can we actually start with you just talking about the, the media brands that you represent, um, their history, and who their typical reader or user is? Yeah, well, Dennis Automotive these days covers a quite a wide variety of titles, covering the market from uh, the most pragmatic car buyer to the most enthusiastic uh, car fan, I think it's fair to say. So the, the main brand that we have is Auto Express, which Dennis bought back in, in the 90s. Auto Express is a, a magazine that sells around 35,000 a week. It's the UK's biggest uh, automotive weekly uh, and a website which is, is just huge uh, across the world. Um, reaches up to 4 million unique users a month at the, in the best months and not in a pandemic, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Auto Express, we, uh, we coined the phrase some years ago that it reaches the everyday car enthusiast. So it's people who love cars, want to know everything that's going on in, in the car world, uh, want to see the reviews, want to see the news, want to see the scoop stories, but they sometimes have something else in their life. They're not quite as, uh, as hardcore car fans as, as some other titles readers might be but they're hugely influential so you know auto express is the, the big beast it's the mothership now if we start right at the pragmatic end we have a, a title called car buyer uh, which is a, a digital play but also has a, a magazine that has, uh, has come off the back of the website and that's there just to help you uh, and your friends if you're not really into cars to get good advice about what car I should be buying next so it's, it's very pragmatic it's written in plain English and it's there to, to hold your hand through what is a difficult process people love having a new car don't necessarily love buying a new car uh, so that's car buyer driving electric guess what it's about electric cars you know, the, uh, the the buzz phrase buzz cars at the moment if you like uh, a lot of electrification every manufacturer is delving into electrification and driving electric is there uh, in a similar way to car buyer to help you through that process that is something quite new and alien to a lot of people uh, then if we we start looking at the more enthusiastic titles we've got octane which is old cars classic cars in a, in a glorious way beautifully shot beautifully written about um, evo does a, a similar job in terms of the uh, the, the production qualities beautifully shot beautifully written stories for real enthusiasts people who love their cars people who spend a lot of money never ceases to amaze me that the evo readers will spend seven figure sums on cars god i wish i could uh, but they do that on a pretty regular basis which is uh, is quite astounding really um one of the newest titles we we bought is a title called car throttle which appeals very much to the the younger uh, car enthusiasts it's particularly uh, strong on youtube nearly three million subscribers on youtube put a video up uh, a car throttle video up on youtube and within a week it's got five hundred thousand views which is which is incredible but it's a very different market for us so i think across the board uh, forgetting of course enzo which is a ferrari mag and vantage which is a uh, an aston martin mag again high production qualities aimed at the enthusiasts of those titles more than any other uh, publisher, we've got a rich a stream of titles that have been built up over the years from the sort of early 90s up to today that cover everything from, as I say, the most pragmatic car buyer up to the most enthusiastic car, car fan and car owner. So it's, it's bigger and broader than any other automotive publisher. Yeah, it really does. It's just so, just you saying that there, it's, it just shows how diverse the portfolio is and how it does really cover all bases in terms of automotive. Uh, enthusiasts and users so Steve tell us a little bit about um, you know why and how you got into motoring journalism uh, yeah slightly strange route uh, and I always say most motoring journalists get into journalism through cars and their love of cars and I, 
I was no different. Um, uh, having said that, I always look for people who are journalists first and foremost these days, not quietly, uh, quietly contradicting my own route into the business. But I've always been a car fan. You know, I always had that that jar with my savings when I was uh, six or seven years old, saving up to when I'd be 17 and been able to buy my my first car, which I bought before I was 17. Um, but my, my route was, was slightly strange. I, I left school at 16, went to work for an insurance company because that's what you did when you lived in a, a sad place called Orpington in South, uh, South East London. Great place to come from, not a great place to go to. Um, so I went to work for an insurance company in London for six or seven years and always had that kind of burning desire to do something different. So uh, left and went to drama school. Um, which clearly worked out well because um, I'm looking at my Oscars on the shelf behind me. Uh, but I did drama school for a while and then soon realised that most actors work in pizza restaurants. Um, always had that burning desire for about cars, always enjoyed writing. And it was a bloke who, uh, on my journey is to get advice from people, who gave me a good bit of advice about getting into TV. Um, a guy called uh, Miles Ross, whose brother Jonathan is quite a famous chat show host. And uh, Miles was a producer in this time. He said, if you want to get into journalism, specialise in something, what do you know? What do you like? Cars. Okay, get in through cars. Uh, so I started writing. My, my uh, gentleman who turned out to be my father-in-law in the end uh, allowed me to do some writing for the local paper he was a, uh, uh, an editor of. So I did a few uh, car reviews there, a lot of restaurant reviews. Um, I've coined such fantastic phrases as uh, a feast to, uh, to remember at... Uh, at the Everest Tandoori, scale new heights of culinary excellence. <laughs> Feast fit for a king at the Royal Tandoori, that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, did what a lot of people do now, wrote a lot of letters, uh, and one guy from What Car asked me to come and do work experience, and I stayed there 17 years. Um, was made editor in 2000, so it's 20 years an editor now, uh, and uh, had a great time. Um, Turned down Top Gear twice uh, along the way, which um, do I regret? No, I don't, not at all. Um, and edited Autocar as well for a couple of years while I was there. Uh, and then I met uh, a rather nice gentleman uh, called James Bonet, and we had a discussion about me moving to uh, to Dennis in 2011 to become editor in chief of Auto Express. Uh, and I've never regretted it since. So that man has a lot to answer for. Uh, because he helped me make the best career decision I've ever made, uh, joining Dennis. Uh, and, you know, it beats working for a living, being an automotive journalist, but it's uh, we've been through some tough times. Um, but if you love cars, there's no better job. You've kind of answered uh, my next question. So, so other than some of those things, can you, can you tell us, are there any sort of game-changing moment, moments for you or the business? Um, everybody says this but there's always a, a degree of luck and being in the right place in the right time but you know I've always got that imposter syndrome waiting for somebody to come and tap me on the shoulder and say okay Fowler come on you know <laughs> you've been kidding them so long but I, I guess you know anybody who who who, uh, who lasts so long must be okay at their job um, so you know the, the, the game changers were their game changers I don't know I think um, one thing I've always tried to do throughout my career is embrace what is what is new um, and embrace reality. And I think more than ever, um, you know, it frustrates me editors who kind of, uh, we'll do the editorial, you do the advertising. Um, and editors that won't kind of work with their commercial teams because ultimately I think you've got to remember that what we do, what you're doing right now and what we're doing is part of a business. Yeah. Um, and a business exists to, to, in many cases, make money. Um, and you have to be realistic about that. Uh, so you have to embrace that. And, you know, I've been really excited by, by everything that we've been able to do digitally when we launched uh, whatcar.com in 1998, I think it was. Um, you know, that was massively exciting. And, and as a journalist, you just kind of want to want to reach an audience you want to make a difference um and it's so lovely when you get feedback from people you help me do this you help me choose this or we enjoyed reading that that's that's fantastic but i think the, the biggest game changers really for, for the industry has been the, the digital revolution which publishing has embraced uh, massively um not sure the car industry has so obviously we're going through a uh, a, a bit of a tough time at the moment well a bit a, more than a bit but um other than now, what would you say either in your career or since being at Dennis has been um, a really kind of tough, tough period to deal with? 
I don't think anything has been as, as tough as this. Um, and I think the problem we have with the, the, the current uh, time is we just don't really know what the future is going to look like. I mean, ultimately, you know, we're in a recession. We will come out of a recession. But, um, you know, we've had these conversations about what shape recession are we in? Is, is it a V-shaped recession? Is it an extended V? Is it U-shaped? Is it bath-shaped? Is it Nike swoosh-shaped? Um, who knows? But this is probably the toughest time that I've been through, you know, 2008 was, was tough. I was at, uh, I was at Haymarket back then. And, you know, you have to make cutbacks. You have to cut your cloth accordingly. Um, and that is, that is really tough, but I don't think anything has been as tough as what we face at the moment. Um, when, you know, part of our job is to go out and test cars in 2008. Sure. There were massive cutbacks, but we were still able to get out and test cars, but not being able to leave your house. Um, is quite a challenge when you're producing a, a magazine that uh, is based around driving cars. I think you talked about 2008 and cutting your cloth accordingly. That's just a good example of, uh, of an editor that's commercially connected uh, and, and not, not sitting there saying, we'll do the editorial, you get on with everything else. And, you know, it is all connected as a business. And that's something that you've always, I think, been strong on and that's served you well. Well, it's important, isn't it? As I say, you know, you can have all these these morals and high standards, which we do as journalists. We, we you know, I've had uh, I've had plenty of, of uh, strong discussions with management in the past um, and will continue to do so in the future. But ultimately, you, you have to remember it's, it's like uh, in, in many ways, uh, I always bring my analogies back to, to football, as, as you well know, James. You know, football, again, we love football, but football is still a business as well. Um, and... It, Fans often forget that, uh, that clubs have to be run as a business. And it's exactly the same in publishing. You know, we have to run publishing as a business. It has to be a sustainable business. Otherwise, A, we're not going to have a job. And B, more importantly, perhaps for us as journalists, the readers aren't going to have anything to read. Yeah. So how are you adapting right now uh, your strategy? And what, what, what things are you putting into place um, moving forward uh, and dealing with the, the current situation that we're all living with? Well, right now, as we speak, we are kind of starting to get out and about again. Um, so we're getting cars delivered. I, I, I went and got a car last week, the first car I got out of uh, lockdown. Sadly, it was a, a Ferrari F8 Spider, um, which somebody had to do it, you know, and, and Ferrari are quite close to me in, in Slough. So it made sense for me to go and pick it up and have it for the weekend. Uh, but um, I've got to say at me, uh, which was delivered yesterday, so rough with the smooth, but um, <laughs> I'm happier with the smaller, cheaper stuff, if I'm honest. Um, but yeah, it, it just means that um, driving is is very different. Um, the roads are quieter, which is a good thing. But in terms of resource, you know, we would normally spend a lot of money on um, locations to, to film or to shoot our, our cars. Can't really do that at the moment. Uh, and also, we can't have two people in a car. Um, because of social distancing so some of the photography that we would normally do with a, a photographer hanging out the side or the back of a car that sort of thing we have to think differently about um, and just you know when we'll be jumping in and out of each other's cars you've got to stop you've got to cleanse everything you've got to make sure you're wearing gloves and masks and all that sort of stuff so all that stuff takes time you know even the delivery of a car on my driveway the guy was here about 10 minutes just cleaning the car rather than just dropping the the keys and going somewhere else he had to have a member of his family come with him to take him home because he couldn't get in a car with with somebody else so you know there are all those sorts of challenges but most of it comes down to um resource and knowing that we've got less resource uh, greater restrictions on what we can actually do uh, and all that is a challenge um but that's kind of a challenge that we as journalists have to come up to have to rise to and come up with creative solutions as we've done over the past what is it, 10, 12 weeks of, of lockdown. Um, we've had to come up with some, some creative solutions to hold content back and to, to dig into those memory banks and, and produce some good stories that people still enjoy reading that feels new and fresh, even though we haven't actually been able to drive a car for the past few weeks. So that's something, you know, James and I have uh, been tackling during, during this lockdown. It's how to be creative with that content and how to kind of uh, still create content for your clients that is fresh um, and, and exciting. Um, I mean, I'd be interested to hear how that, how those first initial editorial meetings looked, uh, you know, when you were going about kind of discussing how, how the next few months were going to look in terms of the content in the magazines themselves. Well, the, the biggest problem was not 
knowing precisely what the end date was or what the future looked like. You know, we didn't know whether we were going to be locked down for weeks, months or, or, or whatever. So, um, you know, we had a lot of content uh, banked. I think it's fair to say we, we as soon as sight of what was coming uh, down the road was uh, was visible, we started banking content. Um, but, you know, that wouldn't last forever. So we kind of had to come up with an editorial plan with new editorial ideas, with with series that would run, um, but always stuff that would chime with the reader, that the reader would, would like, and trying to disguise the fact that, oh, this is lockdown content. Oh, here we go, this is, a, this is lockdown content, um, which is, is quite easy to spot. Um, so, again, it just comes down to being creative um, in, in two ways, thinking about how we can put content onto the website, into the magazine that was still valuable, still had an audience, but spreading it out over a period that we thought we'd have to cover before we could get out and drive again. So, you know, all, all I would say is, um, we're just bloody glad we can get out and drive again now, otherwise it would have become even more challenging. Could and, you... and, and they're the plans that you've been adapting. How, how are the manufacturers, the, 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 the motoring manufacturers, how are they adapting their plans? Yeah, well, that's, that's a, a good question because ultimately the, uh, the, the factories just stopped um, and that's something that, that hasn't happened before uh, and, and causes no end of problems because, you know, the industry reply, uh, or relies on demand um, and supply and being able to get vehicles that keep those factories churning cars out for people who, who want them and demand dried up, uh, but more importantly, the supply of vehicles uh, dried up. But the thing that that I think the industry has, has, has done a lot of things well. The thing that, that frustrates me and has always frustrated me about the industry is the retail side. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of senior people, as you can imagine, over the past few weeks and, and said to them, you know, you guys caught napping here because you've been really slow to embrace uh, the digital revolution. Yeah, you've all got websites. Yes, you've all got configurators. But the part of the car buying process that people like least is the showroom experience. So if you had a fully online uh, experience or opportunity for people to go through the entire process online, digitally, um, without necessarily having to go into a traditional showroom, uh, they'd like that, wouldn't they? Uh, and the industry has been very slow to embrace that. If you look at the April sales figures, who was number one? Tesla was number one, because they've already got a, a model where you buy online. Even if you go into one of their retail outlets, you buy online, you still have to do it online. And they deliver cars um, to your house, or you can go and collect them. Very easy to switch that to contactless. And all the other manufacturers, pretty much without exception, were kind of looking around thinking, oh, oh, right, okay, um, we've got to shut the dealerships. Shut the dealerships. Um, what do we do? Uh, oh, we can't deliver any cars. Um, can people buy? Uh, no, they can't. They can't do it online. They can't contact the dealerships because there's no one in the dealerships. And a few of the senior people have said, yeah, you're right, we, we got caught napping. And they've had to really accelerate their, their digital plans to help people buy cars online because, you know, frankly, that's way, uh, how a lot of people want to buy cars. They might still want a, some sort of experience centre to go and touch and feel and drive the cars. But that whole showroom experience that people are, are used to for the past 40, 50 years, which hasn't changed, they just don't like it. So change will come. Things, I think things are things were always going to go that way, but this this thing's just accelerated it, hasn't it? And as you say, they've yeah. they're struggling to keep up. I mean, Tesla have not got a legacy uh, business, so they've not they've it's, it's less of a challenge, but it certainly is a challenge for people who've got these legacy uh, businesses. Yeah, and it's it's frustrating that neither the manufacturers nor their dealers have really uh, upped their game. You know, there's great opportunity for the dealers if if the manufacturers they represent don't have an online buying buying platform why haven't they set one up yeah. you know one of the, the big mysteries i've always thought over the years is why the dealers don't push their own brands yeah. more um and they, they kind of leave it that this cozy relationship between manufacturers and dealers is something that uh, that I, I kind of understand but i'd never agree with so how do you go about kind of staying positive during these times and kind of keeping your team positive as well um, well, ultimately, we are uh, still very, very lucky to be doing what we're doing. Um, yes, it's it's tricky because uh, we are doing more and more uh, conversations like this rather than in person. Um, but technology has, has really, really helped us. And I think to a degree, perhaps we're all uh, guilty of, of over communicating a little bit, taking a little bit too long to, to talk to each other on video 
calls. Why does everyone, when, whenever you put a video call down, why do you feel the necess necessity to wave as well? You don't do that in a meeting, do you? you <laughs> sort of wave at each other as you, as you leave. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky because people will have highs and lows. You'll get fed up with staring at the same four walls and lack of human interaction. Things will get slightly better as people are allowed to get out now. Um, but do you know what? We've had some fabulous, fabulous feedback, more than ever, from our readers, um, which is a blessing and a curse, because as, as I seem to have less time in my day, uh, our readers seem to have a little bit more and think, uh, I know what, I'm going to just email the editor. Um, but we've had some fantastic feedback, and that really does help to keep you going. And I've been sort of spreading that across our entire teams, to making sure that everybody knows that what they're doing is, is making a difference to people. And, and sure, we're, we're not on the front line, you know, risking our lives to save others, uh, but we are trying doing our best for people who love cars to keep their spirits up and, and uh, keep them entertained. Steve, what advice would you give other businesses, particularly in the automotive trade uh, at this time? I, I think there are, there are two bits of advice I would give. One is um, embrace the digital revolution, um, which particularly in the retail side, they haven't. And, and that doesn't just mean having a website and, uh, or or you know, being able to answer emails. It, it means, I always say, think of yourself as publishers. You know, produce content um, because people want content on their commercial channels uh, as well as on publishing channels. So you know, content is, is massively important for all businesses. Um, so you know, that's something that really has to be embraced. And, and think about putting the consumer self in the shoes of the consumer. I always do something with, the, with automotive companies, as, as you've probably been there with me, James, when I've done them in the past. When you're sort of faced with a room of, of dealers and people who work for manufacturers, said, how many of you guys have actually bought a car in the last year? Um, and they don't because they get they get company cars, so they they don't exactly go through the experience that their customers go through. Having a, a pure customer focus and understanding the needs and worries and everything else about uh, customers is is massively important. Um, Thing, just embrace the, the change and the other thing is just you know keep keep spirits up be optimistic make sure you, your glass is always half full it's very very difficult at some times to to keep that optimism um, but you know the, the world will bounce back it's going to be tough there's going to be some tougher times ahead um, but it's our job to do the very best we can for our for our businesses uh, for our readers for our friends and our families and you know the best way to do that is to be positive and to, to think positive thoughts and to look for a good future. Yeah. I, I think you, you talk about speaking to the, the manufacturers about, you know, the fact that a lot of, a lot of the staff there haven't bought a car. I think you're honest enough to say that of, of journalists as well. And I think you've always been someone that talks to, you know, senior journalists, journalists just starting out, that this is a really, you know, it's an issue and it's just something to be really mindful of going through the, the process of writing copy uh, for, for people who are actually going to buy cars. It's, it's, yeah. It's really good to be as, as a, absolutely. As a journalist, the most important thing is to know what your readership is yeah. um, and know who they are, know what uh, excites them, what worries them. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm very critical of a lot of automotive journalism, which is about creating content for, for yourself, not for your readers, um, which is a surefire way to, uh, uh, to seeing so many closed publications or websites you've got to think about who the reader is and you know it does frustrate me that so few automotive journalists don't own their own cars they don't have to pay for insurance you know they don't have to get it serviced when, when things go wrong and all that sort of stuff um, you know I'm quite proud that I can look out the window and there are, are four cars in my in my household that you know yes I am the the family fleet manager I have to look after them but it does kind of ground you a little bit and just remind you what's important so Steve, how, you know, what kind of impact do you think this will have on the market? Um, I mean, some of our clients have spoken a lot about the used car market and how, how it will kind of affect that, the new car market. Be interested to hear your kind of perspective there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the industry seems to be a little bit split. Um, clearly, there's a lot of people talking up the market. But the, the thing that I would say from a, a new car perspective, whether we're talking cars and commercial vehicles as well, um, the rise of leasing, uh, and, and in my view, one of the, the greatest innovations in the automotive industry has been the, the PCP, the Personal Contract Purchase Plan. 
um, whereby you you have a, a lease plan that runs for three years. They rarely run their full term before the dealer will get in touch with you and say, do you want to go again? Do you want a new car? Pay the same amount every month, have a new car. But the very fact that um, in the retail terms, 80 to 85% of all buyers buy on these lease plans, they have to come back into the market um, after two, three, four years. You know, that's they're contractually obliged to do so. Now, they might just hand the car back and walk away, they're going to need to have some sort of mobility, particularly with a, a prime minister saying, don't use public transport, that kind of place into our hands. Um, so there will still be a, a degree of demand, a degree of strong demand uh, that is, is consistent. It, it might be at a slightly lower level, um, but also interestingly, you mentioned the used market, because I, I suspect there'll be a lot of people who uh, hand back their new cars uh, and look to the used market. So I think that the used market has, has great potential. Um, but as I say, whether, whether you're talking CV, if you're talking about commercial vehicles, you know, vans need to keep on the move. And if you've got a, a three or four year lease on a van, the last thing you want to do is to have it being you know, problematic and have to have maintenance done all the time. So you just flip it onto a, a new lease for a similar cost and, and keep going. So those leases, I think, uh, are something that have potentially saved the car industry. And as, as, as you say, you, it, it, it guarantees a sort of regular relationship between uh, the dealer and the customer there, which is, a, which is always a good thing. Absolutely. It's a, it's a big struggle for manufacturers and for, for retailers to, to keep in touch with their, uh, their customers and to get them into a, into a showroom to have a conversation with them, yes. to see some of the new cars. So anything that does that um, is, is a great thing. And as I say, as, as part of those leasing deals, you have to do that. How do you think this is going to affect the connectivity element um, with you know, businesses and their customers, obviously OEMs as well, uh, moving more online, uh, being pushed more into kind of using uh, social for, to connect with their customers? How do you think it's going to affect that? Well, I think you're going to see the, the manufacturers and the, the dealer groups who do it well thrive. Um, and those who don't necessarily think of, of content and think of communication and think of the, the tone that they use with, with their customers, they're going to really struggle. Um, it's massively important to, to talk to people in the way they want to be talked to and in the format they want to be talked to and on the platform they want to be talked to. And if you don't do that, you're, you're going to struggle with your business. So there's a lot of, of work that needs to be done at OEM level and at retail level. These guys are great at selling, building, marketing um, their, their cars. They're not necessarily uh, so great at communicating. So, you know, they, they need to take a good hard look at their businesses and, and start to do that better. Steve, that's been, that's been fantastic today. Thank you so much for your time. Is there, are there any links that we can put on the bio um, for, for you or for the, for the, for the business there, at Dennis? Uh, just, just some links back to our websites would be, uh, would be great. And your podcast? Yeah, podcast goes out every, uh, every Wednesday. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, we'll, we'll flag that up on Auto Express. Okay. okay. Thanks Once so again, much, Steve. Thank Sorry, you. Lucas. Once again, you can subscribe on Spotify and YouTube. And if you found this of any interest, please share it. So from Lucas, Steve and myself, goodbye. See you later.